Hello, this is Dr. Grande. Today's question is, can I analyze the case of David James Hendricks? Just a reminder, I'm not diagnosing him in this video, only speculating about what could be happening in a situation like this. If you enjoy this video, please like it, subscribe to my channel, and consider supporting me on Patreon. I will put the link to Patreon in the description for this video. First, I'll look at the background of this case. I'll move to the timeline of the crime, then offer my analysis. David James Hendricks was born in Morton Grove, Illinois in 1954 and raised in Oak Park. He was the second of seven children. His parents belonged to a non-denominational Christian fundamentalist group called the Plymouth Brethren. David met another member of this group named Susan Palmer, and they became romantically involved. David graduated high school a year early and enrolled in a prosthetics program at Northwestern University Medical School. In June 1973, he completed the program and found a job in that field. He married Susan on July 28 of that same year. David and Susan had a daughter named Rebecca in September of 1974. In May of 1976, they had another daughter named Grace. And in June of 1978, the couple had a son named Benjamin. Susan had a medical issue which required a hysterectomy in 1980. She was disappointed because she wanted more children. The couple considered adopting, but they never did. David was extremely successful in his career. After working for a company for a few years, he started his own company in 1979 in Bloomington, Illinois, which is about two hours southwest of Chicago. His company sold braces, artificial limbs, wheelchairs, crutches, and other healthcare appliances. The family moved to Bloomington and eventually purchased a large house in a new housing development. David designed his own back brace and started selling it. He did very well financially. For example, in January of 1983 alone, he sold almost $50,000 in back braces. Now moving to the timeline of the crime. On November 8, 1983, David was on sales calls in Wisconsin trying to sell back braces to various physicians and physical therapists. Susan and their three children were at home in Bloomington. David called his wife several times during the day, but did not get an answer. He called his in-laws, but they did not know where Susan was. David started to grow concerned by the evening. He continued calling various people to try to find out where his family was, but no one had seen them. Susan and the children did not arrive at a dinner party as scheduled. David decided to leave his hotel room in Wisconsin and drive back toward Bloomington. He pulled over into a rest area and called his neighbors one more time. There was no new information. As David was driving, the police performed a wellness check on the family. They found Susan and her three children dead upstairs. The family had been murdered with an axe and a butcher knife. Some drawers were pulled out and various items were scattered around the house. David arrived at the family home just before midnight to find that the police had secured his house as a crime scene. The police said that David was calm and did not appear to be surprised by the news that his family had been murdered. Neighbors felt differently. They believed that David appeared to be devastated. Here's what the police found during their investigation. There was no forced entry into the house. Two footwear impressions were found in the carpet. One was larger than the other. Neither could be tied to any shoes belonging to the Hendricks family, including David. There was no blood found in the sinks, bathtubs, or in any of the drains, but luminol staining occurred in the bathroom, indicating that there may have been blood there. The murder weapons were found in the house and belonged to the Hendricks family. The police searched David's vehicle, hotel room in Wisconsin, and luggage. No blood or any other evidence was found tying David to the crime scene. The police searched the route between Bloomington and where David was in Wisconsin, thinking that maybe he threw items out of the window of his Buick Electra, but they found nothing. David described to the police what happened the day before, which was November 7. Susan went to a baby shower. When she was there, David took the children to a shopping mall, then to a Chuck E. Cheese restaurant, where they consumed a vegetarian pizza. David left his children at the restaurant to get fuel and then picked them up. They departed at about 7.45 p.m. 
After this, they checked out some books from a mobile library, which was parked near their home. He said the children were in bed by 9 p.m. Susan arrived home at about 10.30 p.m. David left for Wisconsin just after 11 p.m. By 8 a.m. the next day, November 8, he started making sales calls in Wisconsin. He was over 300 miles away. David did not have sales appointments. Rather, he was cold calling. David's story was partially corroborated. For example, he had a receipt from a gas station stamped at 7.36 p.m. Again, he left his children at Chuck E. Cheese and refueled his vehicle. Various agencies and hospitals in Wisconsin confirmed that David had stopped by on November 8. Investigators concluded that the children probably died between 9 p.m. and 11 p.m. on November 7. They believe this because David told them that the children ate a vegetarian pizza just before 7.45 p.m., and material consistent with that meal was found in their stomachs. Two weeks after the murders, David was arrested. In November 1984, his trial started. David Hendricks was convicted and given four life sentences to be served consecutively. The judge said that he was not personally convinced that David had been proven guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. This appears to be why David did not receive the death penalty. David stayed busy in prison. He remarried in 1988 and self-published a book about another prisoner's life, a killer named Henry Hillenbrand. In July 1990, David's convictions were overturned on appeal. The court found that some of the testimony at his trial was irrelevant. David was tried again in 1991. He was found not guilty of all charges. By 2021, David was living in Florida with his fourth wife and running his own prosthetics company. Now moving to my analysis. Was David Hendricks guilty of murder? Almost without exception, all of the original investigators and prosecutors believed that David Hendricks was actually guilty and beat the system. Let's take a look at the evidence both for and against the idea that David was guilty, starting with the inculpatory evidence. The murder weapons belonged to the family. There was no forced entry into the house. The time of death based on the stomach contents meant that David was home when the murders occurred. David stopped at a Hardy's restaurant in Stevens Point, Wisconsin, that was about six and a half hours from his residence. The receipt was stamped 7.17 a.m. on November 8. This puts his departure from the house at about 12.47 a.m. This means that he was in his house longer than he indicated. Furthermore, this seems like an unusual work schedule. He did not have any sales appointments in Wisconsin on November 8. Why did he drive overnight to get there? The two footwear impressions in the carpet could have been made at any time. They were not necessarily made by the killer. Therefore, it didn't matter if those impressions did not match shoes that David owned. David recently started cutting his hair differently and losing weight. David used models to advertise the back brace he invented. Several models testified that David insisted they be partially naked when he was trying to get the brace to fit. They said that the brace did not require an absence of clothing to fit properly, so they were confused by why David was being so insistent. They also said that he made advances on them and touched them unnecessarily like more touching than would have been required to simply get the brace to fit. They felt extremely uncomfortable around him. The defense never denied that David made advances toward the models. If David was really trying to advertise a back brace, why did he select only young, healthy women for his photographs? Is this really the demographic who would typically need a back brace? The religious group that David belonged to, the Plymouth Brethren, would ostracize anyone who divorced. Susan's sister divorced not long before the murders and was kicked out of the group. Perhaps David wanted a divorce, but was worried he might be thrown out of the group as well. David's statements after the murders were not consistent with being upset. He said that Susan and his children were in a better place. After reporters asked him what should happen to the killer, he said he hoped the killer would find Jesus and be saved. I guess this is as opposed to find Jesus and have a nice conversation. Moving to the exculpatory evidence, there were no witnesses to the murder, no video, no physical evidence tied David to the crime. 
For example, no blood was found on his clothing, in his vehicle, or in the hotel room in Wisconsin. It's hard to imagine that there would be no blood in the sinks, bathtubs, or drains if someone had tried to clean up the crime scene. Luminol staining can occur even when there is no blood. It is not a perfect test. David's shoes didn't match either of the footwear impressions found in the house. David said he may have left the door unlocked, which could explain the lack of forced entry. Using analysis of stomach contents to determine the time of death is a notoriously unreliable method. Susan's sister, Martha Niels, accused her ex-husband of committing the murders. She originally said that he was with her that night, but she changed her story and said that he claimed to be out lifting weights. He worked as an orderly in a hospital. Martha claimed that he came home with blood on his scrubs the night of the murders. It's worth noting that the police do not believe that Martha's ex-husband had anything to do with the crime. When considering all the evidence, do I think that David was guilty? Yes, I think he was guilty in reality, but I do not think he was guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. I think the possibility that someone else killed his family presents a reasonable doubt. The main reasons I think he was guilty in reality would be the fact that the murder weapons belong to the family, David's new interest in the models, and it just seems too convenient that David would leave right as the killer was entering the house, almost like they passed each other on the sidewalk. Moving to the last section, how would I conceptualize this case if David was actually guilty? This is just a theory, my opinion. My conceptualization starts with the belief system of David and Susan. The Plymouth Brethren were not big fans of outsiders. Members of the group pretty much only communicated with other members. The couple invested themselves heavily into this very strict lifestyle. For example, David and Susan did not allow any televisions or radios in their home. They played religious messages on a record player. Susan would read the Bible to the children after breakfast, and David would read it to them before bed. Susan made most of her own clothing and used little makeup. The children were mostly forbidden from eating snacks. The couple did not celebrate Christmas, saying that it had no biblical authorization. The children were not allowed to go out on Halloween. Instead, they would hand out religious pamphlets to trick-or-treaters. This may sound like a less than desirable treat, but I imagine the pamphlets contained less sugar than most candy bars. And with all the fire and brimstone contained in the pamphlets, they probably tasted like hot tamales. David was well-liked among the Plymouth Brethren and did not want to lose his standing among the members. This normally would not be a problem, but David appeared to be increasingly interested in women, like the whole situation with the models. I think that with his newfound wealth, David started to realize that he could have a completely different life. David now had the power to make his fantasies come true, but he had backed himself into a corner with his strict religious beliefs. David wanted to remain in his religious group, he wanted to keep his money, and he wanted other women. The real obstacle for him was his family. David murders his family, but manages not to leave behind much evidence. After killing them, he drives away on what seems like a poorly planned business trip. If David was guilty, I think this case can be thought of as someone wanting to reset his life. David's money and desires moved him further away from a life with his wife and his children. They were no longer compatible with his fantasy. Those are my thoughts in the case of David James Hendricks. Please put any opinions and thoughts in the comment section. They always generate an interesting dialogue. As always, I hope you found my analysis of this topic to be as intriguing as spicy, sugar-free pamphlets. Thanks for watching.